where we want to uh, welcome everybody to uh, Disciples Ignited today, and we want to say Merry Christmas 2022, almost 2023. Thank God for Jesus. Today, we are going to bring to you a very special message on the journey to Bethlehem. So why don't you turn with me to Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And let us read together. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Now today we're going to be ministering to you about the journey to Bethlehem. There were several people in this Christmas message that had a journey uh, to Bethlehem. Oh, and we're going to start with Mary and Joseph's journey to Bethlehem. Now we know that Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth, and here you'll see in this map, Nazareth was on the very far north part of Israel, and Bethlehem was all the way down to the Dead Sea. I mean, this was a large trek, you know, for them to have to go from Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem. Now, Nazareth, as a small town, it probably was no more than a, a dozen families in that town. In fact, uh, it was overshadowed by a city called Sephoris, which would have been right up here. You can see it on this map. Sephoris was really a booming town. It was uh, populated, yes, by, by uh, a Jewish population, but a very large Gentile uh, population. And the government was pouring in a lot of money. It was in a booming state as far as building. And that would have given Joseph a lot of revenue as far as for his work. So we see that uh, the capital city, in fact, Zephorus was the capital city of Galilee, and it was only four miles away. So uh, many people in Nazareth probably did work in Zephorus because uh, it was in walking distance. Now, as I just said, Zephorus was experiencing a building boom during Joseph's entire life, and it would have given him ample work. But Getting back to the Christmas story, we see that Joseph and Mary had to go all the way down to Bethlehem. Now, Nazareth was considered insignificant and generally looked down upon even by the Jews. First of all, because of the forest. I mean, that was the capital city of the whole Galilee region. But besides that... Um, even the Jews looked down upon Nazareth. This is what was said about Nazareth when um, someone told, well, in fact, when Philip found his brother Nathaniel and told him about Jesus. And this was Nathaniel's response. We find it in John chapter 1. We have found the one Moses spoke about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. What was his response? Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked, come and see, said Philip. So that shows us how the Jews even looked upon Nazareth. Now the distance between Nazareth and Bethlehem was approximately 70 miles. You'll look at some um, di uh, dictionaries and they'll say 60 miles, some 70 miles, but um, knowing that it's about 60 miles as a crow flies, it's going to be much longer than that because of all the bends and twists in the journey there. So we'll say about 70 miles. And it would have taken about a week to get there walking. Now, in order to avoid Samaria, which is right here in this whole Samaritan region, in order to avoid that because the, the Jews did not like the Samaritans and the Samaritans certainly did not like the Jews right back. They were really in conflict with each other. Well, in order to avoid that entire area, we see that many times the Jews would 
not go through the Samaritan region, and they would cross over the Jordan, and they would take what was called the Jordan River Valley route. And they would go on the other side of the Jordan, and then near the, uh, where they would be parallel to Jerusalem, they would cross back over the Jordan and uh, travel down to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem. Now, if they did this, that's going to add about 15 miles to the trip. So 70 miles just turned to 85 miles. So, uh, but we really don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us those things. Why? Well, obviously, because they're not important to the redemption story. It's not going to really make any difference either way. It was a long trip, whether it was to one side of the Jordan or the other side of the Jordan, it was a long trip to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, once they uh, got to Jerusalem, Jerusalem was only um, five miles away, I, I mean five miles from Bethlehem. But when we get to Bethlehem, we see that Bethlehem was not looked upon um, too much better or of any more significance than Nazareth. Now, they did look down upon uh, Nazareth, and they did not look down upon Bethlehem in the same way, but it was not thought to be a significant place, even though it was a birthplace of David. Why didn't they look at Bethlehem as more of an important place? Well, <laughs> there's two main reasons. First of all, they were very close to Jerusalem, which was where the temple was. So all the uh, sites were on Jerusalem only five miles away. But then there was another place called Herodium. Look at this. Only three miles away from Bethlehem, you could see it from Bethlehem, was this mound. It almost looked like a mountain, but did you realize this is a man-made mountain? Herod wanted a fortress, but he didn't just build fortresses. He built palace fortresses. And so he wanted it built on a mountain so he would be able to be protected better. And so he had them just build up this mound by just dumping a bunch of earth. And um, then he built a colossal palace fortress. You'll see here, now in fact, you can't see, but inside of it, it was kind of dug up into it. And so uh, these walls around it really covered over a uh, uh, big sunken, two-story sunken area where the palace was. It was called Herodium. So Bethlehem, only five miles from Jerusalem and three miles from the Herodium uh, fortress would have seemed totally insignificant. Now, where Nazareth was probably only about 12 families, Bethlehem was certainly no larger. In fact, it was much smaller. It was really just nothing more than a village in New Testament times. But there's some important facts that we need to realize about this journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Oh! Now there's a lot of traditions uh, that govern our thinking. For instance, every picture that you're going to see of Mary and Joseph going down to, uh, down to Bethlehem, you always see Mary on a donkey. Did you realize that's not in the Bible? Now, I'm not saying it didn't happen, but we, we have no reason to believe that it did, except that it would have been more convenient. It would have been easier, uh, but we don't know for sure. In fact, if it was uh, like mo what would have happened in most people's lives that were poor, they would have walked. Even in her condition, she would have walked in most cases. So, but that's tradition. And it is also a tradition, if you've watched any movies, uh, modern day movies about the, uh, the nativity, uh, you always see Mary just about ready to burst with child as they're getting into Bethlehem and, and Joseph is rushing around trying to find a place for them to stay. But that's not what the Bible really implies. It implies that maybe they had been there just a little while and then she had her child. But we'll get to that later. But there are some important facts that do need to be pointed out. First of all, God used God used a worldwide census to get Mary and Joseph 
to Bethlehem. That teaches us something, or it should. Don't ever discount how God can and will use circumstances to achieve his will. Whoa! He will move heaven and earth to get his will accomplished. Whoa! And if you need to get from Nazareth to Bethlehem and there's no way of that happening, he'll make sure that it is going to happen. Another important fact is God chose two insignificant people, or seemingly insignificant, Mary and Joseph, from an insignificant town, Nazareth, to travel to Bethlehem under dire circumstances. It was all because of a, a registration for taxation purposes. In order to reveal his son to outcast. Do you, you realize that um, the shepherds that were the first to hear of Jesus' birth, that um, although they were shepherding sheep that would have been used for the temple sacrifices calls, they are the shepherds closest to the temple. They were considered unclean because of the job that they did. And so they would have never been allowed to worship in the temple. They were outcast. Even their job was so vitally important for the temple ministry. And what about the Magi? The Magi were Gentiles and possibly even involved in things that the Lord forbade in the law. But yet, God revealed his son to the shepherds and to the Magi. Whoa! Another important fact is don't despair when you encounter closed doors because they do know that when Mary and Joseph did get to Bethlehem that there was no place for them to stay. Now we know that Joseph, he had to go there because that was his family lineage's home. And so he, popped, he might have even had relatives that lived in that area. We don't know. But we know that when they got there, there was no room. Why? We're not told. We're just told that there was no room. Was there no room because they were being shunned? Because they, it looked like they had done things wrong in having a baby before they should have? We don't know. But we do know this. That God opened up the door. Hallelujah! So don't you despair when you encounter closed doors just like Mary and Joseph did. God is always going to open the right door. If you are a carrier of Jesus like they were, he is watching out for you. But I want to minister to you um, something that, that is so important for us to realize. Is that in this season and in this uh, season that we're celebrating the birth of Jesus, but also in this season that the whole world is in, we need to always keep God's perspective before us. How is God looking out on the season that the world is living through? Bethlehem. What was God's perspective towards Bethlehem? We know that it was insignificant in light of the Herodian fortress and in light of Jerusalem. At least nobody thought it was of great importance, even though it was the birthplace of David. But what, what is God's perspective? I mean, God did send Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem to have their child, to fulfill a prophecy. Bethlehem was all about a greater revelation. A greater revelation of Jesus. Do you realize that the presence of Jesus was already being revealed? I mean, Mary was pregnant. And when you looked at her, you saw that she was pregnant. So Jesus in the womb was hidden yet being revealed. 
But Bethlehem was all about revealing Jesus in a greater, more pronounced way. Luke chapter 2, verses 6 through 7 tells us, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger. Now the journey, getting from Nazareth to Bethlehem, was difficult, and it required sacrifices of many kinds. But that wasn't God's perspective. He was aware, of course, of all the difficulties. He was aware of the sacrifices that both Mary and Joseph were uh, having to make because of the call of God upon their lives. But that is not what God's focus is. God's focus is this, that he is giving them overwhelming victory. Hallelujah! Listen to this. This is the message that the Lord sent the angels to speak to the shepherds. And this shows us God's perspective. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Hallelujah! That will cause great joy for all the people. Hallelujah! That's God's perspective. Good news, great joy for everybody, all because of Jesus. You know, if we begin to, in our difficulties and in, in uh, the, the path that the Lord may have you upon may be difficult like it was for Joseph and Mary, and, and maybe things aren't looking like you would like them to look, I promise you, if you begin to change your your viewpoint, change uh, your mind for the mind of Christ and begin to look at circumstances through the perspective, through the mindset of the Lord himself, you will be better for it. But Joseph and Mary weren't the only ones that had to travel to, to uh, Bethlehem. They were also the Magi. Now we know that the, um, the Magi were... Um, they uh, come from a Greek word, magos, which means one of a learned and priestly class. Now, historically, magi were learned men proficient in the knowledge of mathematical calculations, astronomy, medicine, astrology, alchemy, dream interpretation, and history, as well as practitioners of magic. Yes, you heard me right. They did. They were uh, known to participate in magic and even in the dark arts. In fact, the Magi, um, we are told, that came to see baby Jesus came from the East. Now the East, in Jesus' day, would have meant Media, Persia, Assyria, and Babylonia, countries now known as Iran and Iraq. Did you realize that Daniel who lived 500 years before the birth of Jesus, was a leader in Babylon over all the Magi in Babylon. Daniel chapter 5, verse 11 tells us, Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, speaking of Daniel, chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. So Daniel was a, the leader of them all. But he was also a, a devout believer and follower of, of the Lord. Oh, and he wrote much prophetically about Messiah Jesus. In Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he wrote about a vision, he said, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Oh, hallelujah. So Daniel spoke about the Messiah. And all the bad guy that Daniel was over would have been cognizant of these writings because he was the chief Magi. 
And so they would have studied Daniel's writings and revered them. And they would have been passed down over the centuries. And so it is not only likely, it is probable that the Magi that came from the East were very knowledgeable about Daniel's writings, even of his prophecies of the Messiah. Oh! And so they came with this mindset. I want to even propose to you that these Magi that came from the East they may have even been followers of Jehovah as Daniel had been. Oh, even though generally speaking, Magi were all over the place. They were very new age, what we would call new age today. They were just so open-minded that their brains were falling out. I mean, they were just all over the place as far as their belief systems. And many of them were, as I said earlier, involved in in witchcraft and, and dark arts. But Daniel, the chief of them, was a follower of Jesus, a follower of Jehovah and the Lord alone. He prophesied of the Messiah, Jesus. And his writings would have been read and studied. And when the Magi did come, they would, uh, we always see pictures of how many Magi? Three. Well, let me tell you, that is, uh, that's our assumption, but let me just tell you, it is not wise to assume anything when you're reading Scripture. You need, need to just say, this is what Scripture says, and then let Scripture teach you itself. But the reason that they um, have come up with three wise men because there were three gifts mentioned gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so they said, okay, one for each Magi. But let me tell you, the Magi were traveling a long distance with a treasure. I mean, gold, frankincense, myrrh. These were king's treasures. You would not travel from the east. This is a journey of over over a thousand miles, you would not travel a journey like that with three Magi. You were going to travel with a caravan of probably made up of many Magi, but not just Magi. It is going to be a bunch of Magi. It's going to be a bunch of soldiers and servants so that they would be protected on the journey. So for such a trip, the Magi would have traveled as what we would call a caravan, made up of many Magi, servants, and soldiers. And another thing that is uh, shown so much that is uh, really not scriptural is you always see the Magi going to the manger saying they did not go to the manger saying They most likely started out on their journey, which would have taken months because they traveled over a thousand miles. If they were in Persia, they traveled uh, about 1,400 miles. If they were in Babylon, they traveled anywhere from 500 to 800 miles. Uh, so it is a long journey either way. We are told exactly where in the east. We just know that the, in the Bible days that the east covered a vast area, but they were going to have to travel hundreds of miles to get to Bethlehem. They didn't know that they were going to Bethlehem. They were just following this star that they had been uh, studying. Remember, they were astrologers. Some of them were, uh, I mean, so they were astronomers. Some of them were astrologers and believed in the Zodiac and, and so forth and so on. But we do know that they were following this star. They didn't know where the star was taking them, but they were aware of this king that was prophesied by Daniel that was going to arise out of Judah. And so they had their sights towards Israel. When they got there, they um, spoke to King Herod. Now the prestige of the Magi is seen in that King Herod, who was paranoid, I mean, this man, did you realize that he killed one of his sons? He killed one of his wives because he uh, found out that they were supposedly trying to uh, overtake him and trying to kill him. And so, listen, 
he'd kill anybody that he felt threatened by. And so the very fact that these Magi were coming into Jerusalem asking about the king of the Jews, that was a threat that needed to be taken care of. But how did he deal with it? He didn't torture them. He didn't kill them. But he treated them with great respect. Deceptive, yes, but with great respect. As if they were uh, even sent on a mission with his blessing. He wanted to know all about it. Yeah, he wanted to know about it so that he could kill whoever was going to be this next king being born. But the prestige of the Magi is seen and that King Herod treated them with respect instead of torturing them to get the information that he wanted. So the mad guy set out on this long journey. They probably set out when Jesus was born. The light, the, the star was shining. And then when they got to Bethlehem, guess who still lived there? Mary and Joseph. But the Bible does tell us that they lived in a house. Because when the mad guy went, they came to a house, not a manger. Say. But what's interesting to me is that when Jesus was born and these Magi were coming, I believe that they set out on the, uh, the time that Jesus was born, that the light of Jesus oh, was already shining throughout the cosmos, drawing the Gentiles as was prophesied by Isaiah. Listen Hallelujah. to this. Masondo! Isaiah prophesied hundreds of years before Messiah Jesus came. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles. Now we know that this was a messianic prophecy because in the New Testament, Simeon, who was one of the first people to acknowledge that Jesus, little baby Jesus, was the Messiah, quoted this prophecy from Isaiah and attributed it to Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verses 30 and 32, For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation, hallelujah, to the Gentiles and for the glory of of your people Israel. What's happening here? The light of Jesus is shining. I want you to just for a moment take, take a moment and just ponder this on the power of his presence. Even as a baby. The power and the anointing Upon baby Jesus. Oh! The light of God manifesting through baby Jesus and doing a powerful work. And we can see how it joins in with that which was written by John in his gospel, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light oh, shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. The Gentiles! are being drawn by the light Whoa! of Jesus. And let me tell you, that's why Jesus made sure that his disciples understood that he said, I am the light of the world. But then later on, he reverses and said, you are the light of the world. Why? Because they were connected to him. He was going to ascend to be with his father, but they were going to be his representatives. May we, as the disciples, be the light of Jesus in this world. Oh, can you imagine the power of his light 
that drew the Gentiles, drew people to Jesus, may the light of Jesus in us draw people to Jesus. There are some important facts that I want to point out about the, about the Magi. They were seekers. Listen, some people only, only uh, go to church when it's convenient. These men traveled hundreds of miles to see Jesus. Whoa! Convenient? <laughs> Not in the least. But they were seekers. Masundo! They were also, they were not Jewish. They were Gentiles being drawn by the light of Jesus. But they were open to a Jewish Messiah. Masundo! Who is going to be the King of Kings, the Lord over all lords. They were worshipers. The very first thing that they did when they did see baby Jesus is the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, they bowed down and worshiped him. Sundo! And they were givers. Y'all, they gave their best. They gave a kings. They were not kings. Tradition has them to be kings. They even gave them names, but uh, we're told none of that in Scripture. They were not kings. They were magi. They were advisors to kings. But they gave a king's treasure. Sundo! Now this might have been their life savings. We don't know. But they were not kings with a treasure that they could tax their own people to get money for. No, no, no. But they brought a king's treasure to a king not of their ethnicity, not of their kind, but they acknowledged him to be the king, the king of kings. And why did they give? Matthew chapter 2 verse 11 says, they opened their treasure and presented him with gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh so it, you know we always have pictures of them giving one little gift of gold these were gifts of gold gifts of frankincense gifts of myrrh it was a king's treasure but i want to end today with uh, in this christmas message and um i hope that you've seen things that you haven't seen before on. The journey is never easy. It wasn't easy for Mary and Joseph. It wasn't easy for the Magi. It wasn't one of convenience. But it was the path that God had them on for purpose. And I want to end this with, with this question. What about your journey? What about your journey with Jesus? Let's talk about it for a second. Your journey is really just so like Joseph and Mary's and so like the Magi's. It is all about revealing Jesus. Oh! It's not about convenience. It's not about taking the easy road. It's just all about what is going to reveal Jesus the most. On your journey, I'm not asking you to ignore the difficulties that you're going to have to face or the sacrifices that you're going to have to make. But don't major on those things. Be aware of them. That's always helpful. I don't like unhappy surprises. But don't major on that. God doesn't. God doesn't major on the, 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 what was going to take place in Mary's life because she was looked upon as giving birth to an illegitimate child. God is looking at the greater, the greater plan that is being fulfilled. My son is coming through a virgin. So God didn't major on the difficulties that Joseph and Mary are having to go through. He is focusing in on my son is being revealed. Hallelujah! So focus on that. Focus on 
what God is doing through you. Revealing Jesus through his manifest presence. Having Jesus look at it from womb to manifestation. All because you were on the path of God's choosing for Jesus to be revealed through you. Jesus revealed with joy. Isn't that the message that God sent the angel with? Joy to the, to the world. Victory. Provision. Listen, the, the, um, the gifts of gold, frankincense of myrrh, would have made Mary and Joseph, who were poor, it would have made them astronomically rich. That's how they went down to Egypt. That's how they were able to stay down there for the length of time that they had to, to keep Jesus safe, and then go back up to Nazareth and set up shop. All because God had provided. It's all about Jesus being revealed through divine guidance. It is amazing how the Lord led them step by step, how he led the mad guy through the star, how he spoke to them even through a dream, how God uh, sent his number one angel, Gabriel, to Mary, and then later to Joseph, who spoke to Joseph in a dream. It's all about revealing Jesus. That's what the path that God has you on is all about. And God is using your Journey not only to reveal Jesus, Masondo Rasite, but He is using your journey to transform you. Psalm 85, 84, verses 5 through 7, one of my favorite um, passages that I've memorized. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. Your journey is all about God taking you from strength to strength, transforming you through every step of the way as Jesus is being revealed. God is using your journey also to teach you his ways. There, there's a, a passage that I love so much. Uh, many people know the Psalm 23, and they, they can even quote it. Um, but I want you to look at also Psalm chapter 25 that was also written by David. And David requests the Lord. To do something. And I think David's probably thinking about the 23rd Psalm that he had written earlier. And this revelation that David has of the Lord being a shepherd. And now he says, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God my Savior. My hope is in you all day long. See, David was on a journey. Masundo! And throughout David's journey, as was with Mary and Joseph, as was with the mad guy, Jesus was being revealed. On David's journey, oh, his life was being transformed big time. As was Mary and Joseph, as was the mad guys. Oh, and so will yours be. But he also wants you to understand not just what he does, but the Lord wants you to begin to understand why he do does what he does. Let me explain. God revealed his redemptive plan in, he, he, when he spoke of his redemptive plan, he revealed it in bits and pieces through the prophets of the Old Testament. 
was just little bits and pieces. And the Bible tells us in, I believe it's in Peter, how they would, uh, the prophets of old would even group together all these prophecies and they would try to understand it. They would try to, to put it together like a puzzle because it was a puzzle to them. See, the Lord speaks prophetically in bits and pieces. He doesn't speak to everybody like he did Moses, who we spoke to face to face, but he speaks in riddles. And so these prophets would try to make sense of all this. Well, when you're walking with the Lord on the path of his choosing, he is going to teach you his ways. So God revealed his redemptive plan and prophetic bits and pieces and only revealed to those involved that which they needed to know when they needed to know it. Like, for instance, Mary. Did the Lord speak to her about how this was going to really turn her life upside down, topsy-turvy? No, he didn't. He just said, this is what was going to happen. And, and Mary took it. And, and she said that she was blessed because God had chosen her. But boy, it really did change your life. Joseph, it was going to change his life too because anything that affected his, his soon-to-be wife was going to affect him. It certainly uh, affected the Magi. But the Lord only spoke to them that which they needed to know when they needed to know it and why. To keep his plan protected. Do you know the Lord, when you look at the way that the Lord leads his people, it seems as though he keeps his people in, uh, in an unknowing state, in a fog, until he tells them what to do when they need to do it. But why? Shundo! Because he's keeping his plan protected. What would have happened if the Magi knew exactly where they were going? That they were going to, because the Lord had revealed to them, they already saw the star, it's hanging over Bethlehem, and they know that they're going there, and they tell Herod that, that they're going to Bethlehem because the king's son is there. Well, King Herod would have sent his troops there and killed the baby even before the Magi got there. So the Lord does everything he does to protect his plan from Satan and from the flesh of man. Whoa! I want you to just mull on that. So many times you're just begging God to give you guidance. You're begging God to tell you exactly what to do. Where he will tell you what he wants you to do when you need to know. But oftentimes, not before that. Because he is protecting his plan from being, oh, from being in any way compromised by the enemy or by the flesh of man or even by you. But he's also deals with us in such ways because he's keeping us dependent. If you don't know what the next step is to take after you take this step, what do you do? You have to stay dependent upon the one who is giving you instructions. So you're going to learn his ways. So, oh, be thankful for the path that God has you upon. He is drawing you close to himself. He's teaching you his ways. He's revealing Jesus to you and through you. My son, no! And he is transforming your life through the process. Oh, thanks be to God for this redemption message of Jesus born in Bethlehem and how he got people to Bethlehem and how he used them through the process, how he transformed them through the process and how they became people that understood the Lord so much better because of it. God bless you, and may you be blessed with this prophetic Christmas message. Amen.